We'll go ahead and call Fenton State to order. First thing on the agenda today is bill introductions. And I have three um, that people have asked me. RS 3224 related to candidates name on the ballot. Is there any questions, any objections? Not seeing any, it's introduced. Second one is RS 3198. Electric driver's license renewals. Um, any questions, objections? It's, it's introduced. Uh, the third one is um, RS 3201. <coughs> it's the federal CDL. Uh, Senator Byers has this. So is there any questions or objections? Not seeing any. It's introduced. Are there any other bill introductions? Just want to state Senator Francisco is setting in today for Senator Hosher. Um, we'll go ahead and get an overview on Senate Bill 445, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Senate Bill 445 amends one statute uh, relating to advanced voting ballots. Uh, these are the mailed in ballots. Um, <clears throat> this statute, 25 1124, governs uh, the marking and return of an advanced voting ballot. Uh, the bill adds a new subsection to the end of this statute. It appears on page three of your bill as new subsection I. Uh, and this new language would prohibit the use of any drop boxes for the deposit of an advance voting ballot, except those that are actually located inside the building of a county election office or satellite advance voting location. Uh, and so, and they must be continuously observed by an employee during those times when the box is accessible by the general public. Uh, so under this amendment, you would have to uh, walk into the county election office or satellite voting location and deposit your advance voting ballot in the box located inside the building. Uh, the bill will go into effect on July 1st of this year. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Jason, Senator Reichman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, how long have we had... Uh, uh, drop boxes in Kansas? Uh, my understanding is we've had drop boxes for several years. There is no uh, specific statutory language regulating the use of drop boxes, but uh, my understanding is many county election officers consider them an extension of the county election office, and so place, have placed them uh, using federal and state guidance at uh, certain locations within the county for the public to uh, deposit their advanced voting ballots there. Senator Fascado. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jason, so um, the increase of those drop boxes, I guess, kind of came with, with uh, the pandemic, with COVID. Um, so do we know um, uh, approximately how many additional drop boxes were created um, due to uh, COVID or the increase of the drop boxes? And, or, or, I mean, were they created out in front of every election office? in all 105 counties or was it just certain locations? Uh, I do not have any numbers on the expansion of the use of drop boxes for the 2020 uh, general election. I'll probably have to defer to either Secretary of State's office or the Kansas uh, County Election Officers Association for those numbers. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll save that question for Clay at a later time. Clay will be testifying at the end and he'll probably be able to answer all them questions. Do we have any further questions for Jason? Not saying any, thank you, Jason. Let's go ahead and start the hearing for the proponents, virtual, Stuart Whiteson. Whitson. Morning, sir. How you doing? Good to see you again. Thank you, sir. Hear from you. Chairman Olson, Vice Chairman Hildebrand, and members of the committee, Good morning, my name is Stuart Whitson and I'm a visiting fellow at Opportunity Solutions Project. OSP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization dedicated to advancing policies that reduce barriers to work 
and promote free and fair elections by making it easy to vote, but hard to cheat. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to submit this testimony in support of Senate Bill 445. Prior to the 2020 elections, drop boxes were not widely used in Kansas. Then, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, everything changed. In 2020, Kansas saw the number of drop boxes increase by more than 180, thanks to the Secretary of State's offer to purchase two boxes for every county, with 79 counties requesting two new boxes and 12 counties requesting one new box. Johnson County requested seven new drop boxes, bringing its total in 2020 to at least eight. Counties purchased even more additional drop boxes on their own, using generous federal grants to pick up the cost. For instance, Douglas County purchased eight new drop boxes, and with the two received from the state, 10 new drop boxes were added in that county alone. Of course, drop boxes can add a level of convenience for voters, but with that added convenience comes several problems that can undermine the integrity of elections and erode voter confidence in electoral outcomes. One of those problems is that unsecured drop boxes invite tampering, theft, or destruction. Examples of this abound. For instance, in 2020, we saw reports of ballots left in unsecured drop boxes being destroyed by fire in Boston and in Los Angeles. In 2021, an unsecured ballot drop box was vandalized overnight with only one of the mail ballots it contained surviving undamaged. Also in 2020, election officials in Virginia received complaints from dozens of voters of missing ballots deposited in a drop box located outside of the Richmond City Hall. Those ballots were never found, nor were they able to determine how they were removed from the unsecured ballot box without any sign of tampering. By simply placing ballot drop boxes <coughs> inside a secure building and requiring they be monitored in person whenever they are accessible to the public, as SB 445 would require, all of the inherent risks of drop boxes could be largely eliminated. Another inherent problem with drop boxes is that they can unwittingly serve as a tool to help facilitate fraud by partisan ballot harvesters and other criminals. Ballot harvesters who prey on vulnerable Kansas voters, including the elderly and people with disabilities, can use unsecured drop boxes to help facilitate the efforts. For instance, in Pennsylvania this past fall, a county commissioner called for an investigation after surveillance footage captured a man stuffing multiple ballots into a drop box. The act was caught by surveillance cameras, but only came to light after the commissioner obtained the footage through a right to know request and then personally reviewed it himself after the sheriff's office acknowledged that it did not have the manpower to review the video themselves. This example illustrates the need for in-person monitoring as opposed to relying exclusively on 24-hour surveillance cameras to identify and discourage the exploitation of drop boxes by illegal harvesters. This bill would codify that requirement into Kansas law. By placing drop boxes in secure public buildings and requiring they be continuously monitored by <coughs> the county election office during those times when the ballot box is accessible by the public, the two inherent problems that I just described can be largely addressed. And this is exactly what SB 445 calls for. Without a doubt, offering drop boxes with no real security or oversight would be easier for election officials and easier for voters in many ways. But the duty of the Kansas legislature is not only to pass laws that make it easy to vote, but to also institute fair <coughs> and common sense measures that make it hard to cheat, while inspiring confidence in Kansas voters that all legally cast ballots are counted. This bill takes a big step in that direction, and for these reasons, we strongly support it. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Um, we have a couple written proponents. Do we have any other proponents in the audience? Not seeing any questions for the proponents. Do we have questions? Uh, Senator Fascado. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is for Stuart Woodson. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you. Um, I, I like your opening statement of uh, safe and uh, anyway, your opening statement. I, I, I like that of protecting our voting rights. So um, my, my question to you is, so the 
the secured um, drop-off box located inside of the building. Would that be, uh, did you say during business hours? Because in, in my district, I have a lot of the essential workers. And so they sometimes work the, the, the late shift. They get off at midnight and they might want to drop off their ballot. Um, so can you clarify, did you say it's only would be op optional to drop off during business hours? Is that what you said? Uh, no, no, ma'am. So it's just it just because it requires an in-person person to monitor, it's whatever hours, I guess, that office or that the legislature allowed that office to be open, then it would presumably be able to receive. The law just says that it can't that no one can drop a ballot off there unless there's a, a live person there to monitor that. But it doesn't specify the time frame for that. Is that it? Okay. Senator Reichman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> thank you for your testimony. A lot of good helpful information. I guess my question is, I, I'll probably ask the same to the Secretary of State uh, that's here. Uh, do we know of any uh, uh, tampering or ballot harvesting in, in Kansas. I know we uh, we heard a lot of it on TV, you know, after the last election in different states. I would just wondered about Kansas. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Senator. I, I'm not aware of any documented cases. Um, but again, that's getting to the heart of this bill. Unsecured, de a ballot hop harvester improperly using an unsecured ballot drop box, the way the law currently sits, is not going to be detected because there's nothing there. I know there there is surveillance options in some places, but if that surveillance footage isn't actually reviewed by anyone, or if there isn't someone on the ground to actually see the number of ballots they're dropping off and things like that, that type of fraud can't be detected in Kansas right now, in my opinion. Senator Francisco. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So. Um, I'm a little confused. Why would a county election officer have a locked ballot box if their office is open, accessible, and there's a person there? Wouldn't that person just handle um, the votes rather than have it put in a drop box? Thank you for that question, Senator. So yet they certainly could. Or what they could do is if they have other tasks they're doing, so if they're manning a desk, let's say, and they're doing other tasks, the ballot box under this law could presumably be positioned next to them. And so they would be able to monitor that box while they're doing another task that they're assigned to do. But I think this law kind of leaves that to each county and to, to kind of decide how they want to satisfy the requirement. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I would recommend some of my constituents use this because right now, if you, um, um, actually, but well, here's the problem. Your, or your vote will count now, I think, if you've died between the time you drop it off and the election office. But it's, again, I think the issue is how do we help people vote if there's problems with the mail and as Senator Fauscado pointed out, someone is working um, a seven to seven shift um, or may not be in the same town as the county election officer. So um, this, this would actually just um, make those ballot boxes um, not function in the way that I think they've been um, wanting to do. So thank you. Senator Hildebrand. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this bill is kind of similar to one that I introduced, except mine doesn't ban them. Um, but just to give a little background of why I introduced mine, when I was talking to county clerks, one of the things that they thought about manning uh, drop boxes is it would cut down on provisional ballots because at that time when someone would drop a a ballot off if there's a required signature they would be able to catch that before the person actually dropped the box off and left um, so having those uh, manned is a very good idea and i did hear of one <coughs> instance where someone had dropped a was going to drop their spouse's 
ballot off at a drop box that was manned and it did not have a signature on it and the man got upset and just ripped up his ballot but they did go and pick up the ballot and piece it together and put it as a provisional so and it ended up counting so in that case they had a witness and that lady's vote did count in the final version so okay other questions or comments <clears throat> for the proponents okay thank you uh, we'll move on to the opponents, Michael Pape, virtual. Are you on there? I am, yes, sir. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yep, go ahead. Excellent. Um, good morning, Charleston, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify virtually in front of you today. Uh, Mainstream Coalition opposes SB 445. Uh, we know that ballot drop boxes are safe and secure means for Kansans to cast their votes, especially when they struggle to vote in person on election day or prefer not to rely on mail ballots. SB 445 continues an attack against the proven election measures that Kansas rely on to vote. This bill would make advanced voting less accessible and less reliable for voters. It would also increase the cost to make logistics more difficult for county election offices as they would be required, uh, as we've heard, to continuously observe the advanced ballot box. Last week, this committee uh, took testimony, including ours, regarding SB 388. At that time, and again uh, from a previous conferee today, the security of drop boxes were brought into question, with a small number of cases in California and Massachusetts used to justify limiting access to drop boxes throughout the state. We've heard numerous times from the Secretary of State's office and confirmed by uh, Mr. Whitson today that Kansas elections are safe and secure, and there are no documented cases of fraud concerning drop boxes in Kansas. Even so, concerns for so-called election integrity continue to surface without acknowledging one of the main reasons why Kansas <coughs> question the security of our elections, the propaganda and the fear-mongering during the 2020 elections. This, not an unmanned ballot drop box, a three-day grace period for mail ballots, or any other reason cited by outside interest groups, is the reason why Kansans are questioning whether our elections are fraud. We ask you to please do everything in your power to make voting more accessible to Kansans, and we urge you to oppose SB 445. Thank okay. you very much, and I'll stay for questions uh, when appropriate. Okay, we'll hold questions. David Hamlet? Virtual. I think all the rest of mine are virtual. So, all right. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Olson, members of the committee. Um, again, I think with this bill, as many of the the bills that we've seen related to election this year, this, it's kind of unclear where this bill came out of. Um, you know, I know this was introduced by Opportunity Solutions Project. Uh, you know, Mr. Whitson, this is a uh, someone in Washington, D.C., who's unfamiliar with Kansas election laws and our procedures, doesn't understand the security measures already in place. Just for example, for a ballot dropped in a drop box to even count, um, that means that someone had filled out a form to request a mail ballot. They had entered their driver's license number, their Kansas driver's license number, and they had their signature matched. The ballot was sent to them. And then they had this signed out to the ballot. That ballot gets dropped in a drop box, taken back to the election office. And then the election office verifies that signature again. So any of these concerns, we know these votes that are being dropped in a drop box, they're verified to have come from Kansas voters by their signature. Um, and that was already being done and that law was reinforced last year by a bill passed out of this committee in the legislature, which was 2183. Um, I, beyond just the issues with this, uh, this bill, which it's, um, it's really baseless. It's based out of uh, just no context in Kansas. Again, this is a group that has no experience with Kansas law, our election system, or our election security measures. Uh, it's really unclear what this bill is actually supposed to do with how it's written. Um, and I just want to draw attention to, uh, to page three on the bill where uh, subsection I where the language of this is placed, it refers back to subsection A, and that's actually talking about ballot boxes that you drop a filled out ballot in, not a sealed advanced ballot envelope, but the box you would actually drop a raw ballot in. 
And, and what that's about is this section is, is if you go into an advanced voting center and you have voted by mail, you actually have the opportunity to instead uh, not drop it off in the envelope, but have yourself marked off and actually take your raw ballot and put it into the ballot drop box. So I'm not sure, or the, the ballot box, I'm not sure this bill uh, would even do what the proponents think it would do. And certainly it's written in such a vague way that it could open um, the state up to litigation and close elections because legal interpretation is unclear of what exactly this means. Um, there's a variety of reasons people would use drop boxes, you know, from mail being slow to no mail Tuesdays um, and all sorts of reasons, including distrust of the government. But I do want to say one other thing. Uh, I might be the only person, I don't think, um, or actually there is one Shawnee County uh, Senator on this committee. Uh, but as a resident of Topeka and Shawnee County, it might have been the only county that in 2020 tried to do this manned drop box thing. And that's actually how I voted in 2020. And how that went is it was only during um, business hours. It was right in front of the election office and they had a line of people outside of it. There was a long line of cars and, you know, there were plenty of volunteers and election staffers trying to make it move, but you had to get in this long line of cars. It got to the point where you were surrounded by campaign signs because you essentially it had gotten pushed so far back. Um, the process was frankly, in my opinion, much more sketchy than just being able to go up and drop my ballot in a, in a ballot drop box. Um, and it caused a lot of confusion too, because they were trying to do remote pop-up sites. It was at random hours. It, it, was, a, it was a huge issue. Um, instead of just being like, here are where the drop boxes are and they're checked every night. Um, again, when drop boxes are checked, they're checked by uh, someone representing Democrat and Republicans. There's a whole chain of custody process for these ballots. The drop boxes might be actually, you know, one of the most secure ways to do this. I um, mean, also there's a lot of security measures related to drop boxes, including preventing fires from starting them and other things. Uh, I'm happy to stand for questions when appropriate, but before y'all act on this, you really should do much, much more research in, into this because I'd also let you know that some of the information given to you last year by Opportunity Solutions Project was in fact uh, later proven to be false and I could provide that context too. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, next up is Rabbi Modi uh, Reiber. Hi, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members, members of the committee. Uh, Rabbi Moti Reber, Executive Director of Kansas Interfaith Action and Interfaith uh, Justice Organization, representing many of the mainline denominations as well as Jewish and Muslim communities in Kansas. Um, our principle is that everyone who is eligible to vote in Kansas should be encouraged and allowed to vote. Um, I think out of all the bills that we're seeing um, heard by this committee this year, this is probably the most unnecessary one. Um, as the Secretary of State has said, as, I, as you've heard on many occasions, uh, drop boxes were uh, secure, they were convenient, um, there was no chicanery. Um, I myself used the drop box outside the central branch of the Johnson County Library along with my family. Um, it was, it, there's really no problem here uh, that the, that the, for this legislation to address, having them be, have to be secured inside a building, as Senator Faust uh told us, uh, would essentially eliminate the convenience of the of the of the mechanism, meaning that people who have jobs, uh, people who have uh, uh, people who have uh, kids in school or who are caregivers would not be able to use this uh, convenient and secure uh, means of casting their ballots. And I have, you have my written testimony, but I have three more points I want to make. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you and I in a different context had a conversation about setting, uh, setting a playing field and then not messing with it. Um, I think that every time if we, you know, I, I think it's the job of the, of the legislature to set a stable environment for elections. And every time you finagle it, every time you play with it, every time you mess with it, 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 it changes the rules of the game, confuses people and means and keeps people from being able to vote. You know, I, we, I used to have a, a friend who, um, who, whose slogan was set it and forget it. And I think that, you know, if there's a problem that we can address it, but just kind of tinkering with it every single year, changing the conditions, it really leads to um, problems and keeps people from being able to vote. Also would encourage you to think about how all these different bills interact with each other. So if you limit 
the post office return and if you limit drop boxes after adding those to the problems of uh, uh, to the prohibition about against gathering ballots last year, you're really leading to a situation where people will find it difficult to find a mechanism where they'll be able to vote aside from going in person, which isn't always uh, possible for people, which is why we have advanced ballots in the first place. And I also think it's 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 indicative that the only proponent um, of this bill is a uh, dark money think tank from Florida. And I think the point has been made that, um, you know, people, to, uh, you know, WebExing in from Florida to tell Kansans how to run their elections. You know, we don't need that. This is the most unnecessary of all these bills. I really encourage you uh, to vote it down and, and, and let's, keep, let's keep Kansas elections uh, safe, secure, and accessible for all of us. Thank you so much. I'll stand for, I'll sit for questions at the appropriate time. Okay. Thank you. Um, Caleb Smith. Members of the Senate Committee on Federal and State Affairs. My name is Caleb Smith with Kansas Appleseed. Thank you for giving me a brief moment to explain why we oppose Senate Bill 445. So the data is clear that when more people vote, more communities thrive, and more Kansans show better health outcomes across the board. Advanced ballots are an important tool to make it easier for people to exercise their right to vote, and they help address the effects of potential election day obstacles. It's like bad weather like we're experiencing today, long lines at the polling places, or just the inability to take time off work at the last second because of an unforeseen emergency. And this is especially true for communities like rural populations who already face long distances to polling locations or disabled populations who already face great, greater obstacles to the ballot box. In fact, the use of secure ballot drop boxes is demonstrated to improve voter turnout by as much as 7%, which is a huge um, increase in voter participation, looking at just one tool in our civic toolbox. So, but this bill, attempts to make it so that the only real type of ballot box could be used is the ballot box inside the county election office or satellite advanced voting site for voters delivering their advanced ballot in person. Um, and it would also require that this ballot box be continuously observed by an employee when that box is available to the public. So requiring counties to have a dedicated employee continuously observing a locked ballot box is just an enormous waste of money that could potentially make elections less secure, not more secure. Forcing counties to use their limited resources of very skilled employees and limited employees in such a way would just stop them from doing other tasks to monitor and administer elections to make sure they go forth safely and securely. Um, the use of a locked ballot drop box, however, is a secure method of improving access to voting. In fact, there's not a single documented incident of voter fraud using ballot drop boxes in Kansas, according to the Heritage Foundation. Access to these ballot drop boxes improves voter turnout, allows for safe voting during pandemics or during just bad weather days, and makes it hard. And this bill will just make it harder for people to vote and would potentially compromise election integrity at the same time. For all these reasons, Kansas Appleseed opposes Senate Bill 445, and I'd be happy to stand for questions at the appropriate time. Okay, we'll hold questions until the end of the opponents. Um, okay, Arlene, is it Burquist? Eileen Burquist, and yes, I'm trying to turn my camera on, but it is not letting me, so I'll just go ahead if that's all right, Chair. That's fine. Thank you, Chair Olson, for the opportunity to speak today. The ACLU's primary concern is that we do not want to limit the ability of, of voters to cast their vote. Uh, ballot boxes provide much needed flexibility to voters in a busy modern world. And that flexibility has been even more crucial to our civic engagement during a worldwide pandemic. So removing them is unnecessary and could severely curtail Kansans' ability to cast their ballots. As has been stated, there is no indication that ballot drop boxes in Kansas are unsafe or unsecure. What we heard today were a handful of reports from other states that don't take into account the verification measures all ballots from these boxes go through before they are counted in Kansas. So again, we see this bill as a solution to a problem that is being manufactured 
We respectfully request that you do not move bills out of committee that limit voters' ability to cast their votes in the most convenient, safe way possible. Instead, we ask that you focus on legislation that will expand voting access to Kansans and strengthen faith in our voting systems by empowering our local election officials. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Celia King, League of Women Voters. Uh, yes, can you see me? Yes, yeah. I think you can. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> All right. Loud and clear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm Seal King with the League of Women Voters of Kansas. And a couple of my mentions were already, uh, kind of my uh, reasons were already mentioned. But one thing that wasn't discussed is that uh, drop boxes are designed in close collaboration with election officials to ensure that ballots can't be damaged or tampered with. We have slope tops to remove rain, flanges across the slots to prevent water into the box, uh, slots that only accept one or two ballots at a time, and access doors designed so that they have to be locked shut, make it in, making it impossible for a worker to forget to lock them. They weigh roughly a thousand pounds and are bolted to the ground. And most in Kansas have video scrutiny, if not all. Uh, during his presentation to the House Elections Committee on February 5th of this year, Kansas Secretary of State Scott Schwab said that drop boxes are secure and more reliable than the USPS. The ballots go directly to the county election office instead of being sent out of state for processing. Ballots are collected by election workers, one from each party. Drop boxes are under video scrutiny, unlike the US Postal Service drop boxes or your own house drop box, perhaps, so that if somebody was trying to deposit more than a legal limit of 10 ballots, they would more likely use the Postal Service box. Drop boxes are emptied at 7 p.m. on election day and locked so that no more ballots can be dropped. And drop boxes have been successfully used for decades. Uh, Scott Schwab, <clears throat> Secretary of State Scott Schwab, also did mention that he would like to see some regulations regarding drop uh, ballot drop boxes so that all counties were handling them the same way. He suggested that regulations be put into writing regarding cameras, timing, frequency of removing ballots, and procedures for election workers. At no time did Secretary Schwab suggest that ballot boxes be limited to inside an election office and only available during working hours. In Kansas, as mail ballots are only sent to those that, re that have filed a request for a mail ballot and have provided their government-issued photo ID. Ballots are tracked and only accepted if signatures match to the voter that has requested the ballot. So when you continually hear about ballot harvesting, I don't see where that comes from. If you have to uh, secure <clears throat> the ballot with the application and your government issued photo ID, all those ballots that are returned have to be signed by the voter and those signatures are checked. One other thing that this uh, bill does though, in a statement that is actually the one paragraph that changes, it says no county election office shall use any form of ballot box for the deposit of advanced voting ballots except a locked ballot box located at the county election office or satellite advanced voting site. So this would seem to remove the possibility that voters could return their advanced mail ballot to a polling site on election day. And I know as an election poll worker, the, um, we had bags that were locked and secured at our polling site on election day that people could come in and drop their mail ballot in, the, in this envelope into this uh, locked bag uh, on election day. And this would seem to remove that option for voters, which is another troubling aspect. I appreciate your time and hope you vote no on Senate Bill 445. Thank you and I'll sit for questions at, at the time. Okay. Um, 
Looks like we're at the end. There's several written testimonies. Uh, do we have questions? Senator Hildebrand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is going to be referred to uh, Davis Hammett. Davis, are you available? Uh, Clay, uh, yes, Senator gonna, I am. Okay. Hang on one second. Clay, we're going to have you. You're neutral, so. <laughs> oh, you were? Okay. Do you want to testify as opposition? Uh, go ahead, then. Hang on for questions. I had you down as a neutral, but uh, go ahead and do your presentation as opposition. I'm Clay Barker, the general counsel for the Kansas Secretary of State. And, and we had changed our position on that. Originally, we were neutral and then became opposition. I thought I'd just start with a small anecdote. Two weeks ago, I was in Yuma, Arizona, visiting my mother, reading Brad Cooper's article on drop boxes, and I literally ran into one on the street, took a picture of it in case no one believed me which I thought was a sign that these are going to be an issue before the legislature. Um, Secretary Schwab is generally very deferential to the legislature, having been in, in the House and a legislative leader. He um, normally would be neutral on bills of policy. Yesterday we had a meeting on this particular bill in the office, took different inputs, and, or maybe it was two days ago, and he directed us to be in opposition to this bill, and I'd like to explain why. And again, we're always deferential to the, the legislature's policy. Uh, it's two reasons. One is so how this affects the uh, voting and the other is a legal argument. The legal argument, and it was brought up by some of the other conferees, is the way this, this bill is structured. And I suppose that could be worked around by amendments. But the paragraph I at the end, which is added in, refers back to paragraph A, which is existing law. And the last three words of paragraph A are without an envelope. It's referring to ballot boxes where the ballot is not in an envelope. And that's where a voter comes in to the, either the county election office, the satellite office, signs the poll book, is given a paper ballot, fills it out, folds it, gives it back to the election worker who puts it in a box with a slot on the top. And those boxes have always had to have bipartisan continual monitoring because once a ballot goes in, you can't unring it. You don't know who put it in there unlike an envelope where the security is on the envelope and it would be processed later. That creates the, the odd reading of this bill. There's two plausible ways of reading it, and I've had other lawyers look at it for me. One is that it's just restating the current law that any box where we call them naked ballots sometimes go in has to have continual monitoring and be bipartisan monitoring so no one tries to put extra ballots in there. Um, the other way is that it would ban any type of box where a ballot with an envelope goes in. And that would be provisional ballot boxes at the voting locations, drop boxes, ballots at county election offices, satellite offices, and polling places where people can come in and drop off an envelope ballot. Um, now I'd like to switch briefly to the history of drop boxes. I, a question I get asked frequently is where in the statutes does it specifically authorize drop boxes? And the simple question is it doesn't. Uh, the Kansas election law, as I've mentioned before, has been built piecemeal since 1861, added, taken away, added, taken away. Whenever something is mandatory, the election staff does it. Whenever something is prohibited, the election staff does not do it. Sometimes those prohibitions and directives are very detailed. Sometimes they're very general. But things in the middle where we're getting done what the legislature's told us to do, uh, we use our common sense and discretion and just... So drop boxes is one. Another one is election night results. Nothing in statute requires us to put out anything on election night. We could just shut the doors at seven and say, come back at county canvas and find out who won. I'm sure there'd be a bipartisan crowd outside the office immediately if we tried that. But that's an example of something the, the election staff does as a public service that's not directed. Um, ballot bo or drop boxes, as long, as far as we can tell, have been used since the mid 1990s when no excuse mail balloting came out. They were generally outside offices or drive through. They became very popular, obviously, in 2020 because of COVID. And I don't know what their use will be in the future. COVID could be a spike and counties will go back to maybe just using one or two. I believe Mr. Whitson's numbers sounded correct. We purchased with federal money about 180 for the counties, but some counties purchased their own with county money. Some already had them. Uh, some used the governor's cares money to purchase them. So I can't tell you how many are actually used in Kansas right now. 
Um, yesterday at the House elections, there was a, the bill that also heard by this committee about removing the three days for mail balloting. And one of the reasons that was given to the House members there was that by eliminating the three days for mail balloting to come in after election day, the, the drop box would be the option for somebody with a ballot in an envelope on the weekend or Monday before the election that needed some place to take it. Uh, this statute also can create conflicts with other laws, and we just started looking through this, possibly with the voter ID law on the ballot envelope, and also on other statutes that refer to boxes where, where ballots can be dropped off. Um, we all know that the UPS is, and again, don't want to disparage them, it's becoming more slow and unreliable, so voters are looking for an alternative for ballots placed in envelopes. In the 25 years the drop boxes have been used, we have no reports of a single incidence where a ballot was in a drop box that had not been requested by a voter. Now, in some states, ballots are mailed out to every voter. And that's where I think you can have a problem like California where ballots can pile up in an apartment and somebody could take them up and harvest them and drop them off. We've had no reports of vandalism of any Kansas drop box. I think the only incident I'm even aware of is a, a lock was stuck on one in Johnson County and they had to get WD-40 to open it because the box was so new. And that one was actually right by my house. I drove over to help them. Um, and as far as ballot harvesting goes, I know some of you have known me from my past life. I was sort of a street operative and I kind of know how election work goes and you try to get as many ballots in as you can. But if I was doing ballot harvesting, which is now illegal in Kansas, and thank you for that, I would not go near a drop box. They're under surveillance. People are watching them. The, the penalty for screwing with the election system is worse than with the postal service. I just take it to a post office box. Either pay for the postage or put it in and hope the post office delivers it without postage, which they usually do. And that brings me to my final point. Um, what we would like if the committee wants to move on drop boxes is the direct authority to regulate them because right now they are unregulated in Kansas. And that would include physical security of the drop box and CISA, the federal government has put out guidance, which we start as a basis, probably make it more strict than CISA. Uh, the procedures for transferring ballots out of drop boxes, right now it has to be a bipartisan group, one Democrat, one Republican picking them up. Some counties actually have a sheriff's deputy go with them for security. Also two days ago, coincidentally, the Department of Justice gave us their ADA guidance on drop boxes, things like the, the level of the sidewalk so people can approach them and clearing brush out of the way. So there's a lot of work done on these already. And last point to answer Senator Hildebrand's point about having a person there to sort of just look at the envelope before it goes in. Um, perfectly valid point, Senator. Uh, just some counties have a security flap on their ballot envelopes, not required where you, no one can see the signatures or any of the boxes filled in, that only the, the county election staff can see that. Um, but again, Mr. Chair, that is our testimony on, on this particular bill. And again, I'm sorry about the confusion about the neutral or opposition. We changed our position recently. Not a problem. Senator Hildebrand, you got the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll, I'll change direction since Clay's up there. You made a, I've heard this comment several times that they're always under surveillance, but then you ended your remark with there's no uh, standard uh, security. Are you under the impression that every ballot drop box in the state of Kansas has surveillance camera or is under surveillance? No, Senator, I don't believe they were. We recommended strongly that they be under surveillance. So some counties put them, say, by a library entrance where there's already a camera. Others bought those cheap cameras to watch. But we could not direct that. And I cannot say that they were all under surveillance. I doubt they all were. Because some of the rural counties put it maybe out in the second city of the county to help with delivery, but we would make that a requirement. Right, so I guess my concern would be why would you got the Secretary of State and the Secretary of State's office continually use that line that they're safe because there are cameras on each ballot, drop box when that's not the case? Um, Senator Hildebrand, it's my understanding from talking to counties that most, the vast majority were under video surveillance. That's probably where that statement comes from, but I can't tell you that they all were. I just don't know. I can tell you that they are not all, because I have talked to counties that do not have surveillance on them. And that's what concerns me. You, you know, you keep saying these are the most secure because of surveillance. But let's just say they do have surveillance cameras on there. Someone, how often are they checked? How often do people get to look at them? You know, I can go in and drop 10 ballots off. And if it's a low definition resolution, you don't know if it's 10 or 1. 
I could drop 20 off. So it's not safer than mailing the United States Postal Service. It's probably about the same. So that's all I have. But I do have a question for Hammond. Yeah. Go ahead and answer. I, I just say, Senator Hildebrand, those are, those are valid points. We've heard the issues about camera angle and, and quality of the video, and our plan is to address that if we are given authority for regulations. And um, I suppose on the security, it's just that if you were doing something wrong, the chance that that ballot box or the drop box has video is quite high, that somebody may not know whether it's on video or not, and would probably go to a post office box without it. If you couldn't see the person or the number of envelopes, you could at least see the perhaps a uh, license plate on a car or something of that nature. Senator Hildebrand, you still have the floor, and then I'll get you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hildebrand. And just a follow-up comment that if someone was going to vandalize or drop a uh, match or something in that drop box, that surveillance camera is not going to stop that. It'll be after the fact. So I do have a question for uh, Davis Hammond. Davis, are you available? Uh, yes, I am, Senator. Hey, thank you for your testimony. You made the comment that um, someone had provided false testimony and you would like to provide that to us. I think that any time uh, another conferee calls out another conferee for giving false information, I think that they need to provide that information. So um, I would appreciate that if you could get that to the committee as soon as possible because those are serious allegations. And I know from experience sitting here that um, some people say false things, not intentionally, I hope, but um, maybe misspoke. And there was a comment made of dark money. Uh, it's, I find it interesting because some of the other testimony is dark money as well. So that's all I have. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, may I respond quickly to that? May I respond, Jim? Um, Yes, I'd be happy to provide that. And just so you know, um, here what I was referring to is this was on the bill where y'all were banning um, county election offices from receiving any sort of grant or support, um, even though many government agencies do. And they had uh, alleged that um, a county, and I think it was Wisconsin, had been uh like had brought in partisan operatives to run part of their system and all this stuff. Um, and that was, uh, that was debunked. That was um, uh, like a loose accusation that was quickly proven untrue. But yeah, I'd be happy to provide that. Uh, should I just email everyone on the committee or should I email the committee uh, assistant? You probably want to send it to the committee assistant and he'll disperse it. The way I look at testimony, you know, we're, um, I'm not, saying that it's a lie or I'm not saying it's right or anything's accurate. I would never do that. Um, you know, you can put what you want into writing, but, um, you know, I think everybody has to take it. You know, we're not a judge and a jury here on testimony being factual. So, okay. Uh, Senator Kloosh, you have uh, information or a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and this is a question uh, for uh, Secretary of State's office, uh, Clay. You got your mic on? or Yes. Secretary Clay Barker, is that who you wanted? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, just, just a few things for clarification. Um, so are you in agreement with the testimony from uh, Stuart Whitson in regards to how many boxes uh, they, that were are currently out in that paragraph. So he talks about seven new boxes uh, here, Douglas County, eight new boxes. This is this all confirmed, uh, Senator? I my office confirmed with me that with the CARES money that was given to the Secretary of State, 180 drop boxes were purchased. Some counties received one. Some counties received two. Uh, Johnson asked if they could get some extra ones that other counties didn't want it. So that number sounded correct. I don't have the numbers for you about how many drop boxes were already existing, how many were bought with county funds, and how many were bought with other CARES money that the governor had given to counties to use, and there were some. So, so it's at least 180. So who, who determines then, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, 
who determines how many boxes uh, in each county and and what if there's no statue what would be the limit center that's there is no limit set and we left it up to each county to decide what they wanted to use and again I don't know if 2020 will provide them a guide mark for the future the demand for Dropbox use may go down and they'll reduce the use but we offered each county two and do you is okay yeah yeah one one quick thing if you wouldn't mind uh, having a spreadsheet put together when each county and how many they have um, that would be good you know because we've had that question constantly who has them when did they get them uh, go ahead Senator Clues. okay um, j just a couple quick questions um, do, do you foresee the secretary's office um, you talked about putting some regulations together um, do you see putting a limit uh, on how many per county, maybe based on size or voter population, or Senator, I hadn't considered that. The CISA guidelines give a an estimate of how many drop boxes for population, and we thought that number was too too high, too many drop boxes. Um, and then just, you were, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. And I'm just speaking kind of off the top here. We probably wouldn't regulate that. We'd leave it up to each county to decide its own needs, but we could. Put a limit on it and then uh, just a follow-up uh, concerning uh, all this obviously is coming for from the perspective of security um, is there any reason why boxes couldn't be because we're talking about 24-hour surveillance whether it's a camera an individual and that costs money and um, is there any reason why these boxes couldn't be placed more strategically like sheriff's office uh, police department fire department somewhere that you know would be less likely having issues that's a, a definite consideration senator i know some counties only put them on county property that way they didn't have to worry about signing leases or agreements with other businesses or city government they put them at libraries sheriff's office facilities like that where they already own the ground and they could Put it in there, bolt it in the ground, and make sure it's already under surveillance. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Oh, Senator Francisco, you had one. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, and Clay, these are not for you. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Oh, although actually, you know what? You can probably answer this as well. So the first thing I wanted to do is make a comment. I appreciated the testimony from the League of Women Voters. And one comment they made in their written testimony um, was that um, this would restrict the availability to those who have the ability to park their vehicle and get inside the building. So another advantage of a drop box is... Um, you can, um, if you've got a vehicle, you can get in and drive. You don't have to get out of it um, to use that. So, um, Clay, when we were um, talking about, you know, what um, there is already to make sure that these ballots are um, secure um, and some of the um, other um, opponents um, identified those. In addition, I know that our county clerk um, has a system where he, you can check to see if the county office has received the ballot. So that's another way to assure a voter that if they put it in a drop box, that they know then that the county officer received that. Have, do many counties have that ability or? Senator, I think Douglas County might be a step ahead of some others in the ability to track where it is in the system, but Voter View, which is a web link on the Secretary of State's website, allows you to see any time a mail ballot's been received by the county and checked in. So you can see if your ballot got there, which means occasionally on a Monday, somebody may check, and if their mail ballot hadn't arrived, they may go vote provisional on Tuesday. And again, when you give it to the Postal Service, it can take seven, eight days before it arrives. So you put it in a drop box, it will be there that night at the county election office. But in addition to the other security, a voter could know that they're a ballot that they left in a 
in a ballot box was not tampered with and had arrived, or they could know that it had arrived um, at the election office. Yes, that's available to every voter. Thank you. In every county. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Not seeing any. We're going to go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 445, and uh, we will turn back to other business. Uh, we're going to discuss working Senate Bill 376, um, and we were working on that a little bit yesterday, or was it yesterday? And there were some questions that arose. I thought maybe we could have Ryan Vincent. He prepared a little statement. Michael, can you pass that out to everybody? And maybe uh, Ryan could go over it. Okay, it's this little piece here on the housing. So why don't you just kind of do a quick go over because Senator Straub's not here, but she had some questions. And that way, if she wants to look at the video, that'll help answer it. Go ahead. That sounds great. Thank you, Chairman Olson and members of the committee. Uh, you've, you've heard a lot of different housing uh, testimony and presentations and have considered several different bills. Um, so legitimately have some good questions about just the status of the bills and the program itself. Uh, the Moderate Income Housing Program, MIH, that's administered by KHRC. Um, the, the question that Senator Straub had, from my understanding of watching the video yesterday, was specifically about how those funds, which by statute are limited to cities and counties in rural communities, ultimately benefit tenants or developers um, to, to get the housing built, which was a great question. Um, again, by statute, we have to give the funds to cities and counties and rural communities. However, um, we have been able, um, through our request for proposal, to make it as broad as possible. Um, so what we do is we allow cities and counties to partner with developers, with property management companies, um, with nonprofits, with economic development corporations, um, anyone as broadly as possible that would have um, expertise and the ability to develop housing can partner with the cities or counties. Ultimately, the only condition is that the city and county is the applicant for the funds and they're legally responsible for the compliance. So of course they then, when they're awarding the funds to the developer or the nonprofit, um, they're gonna ensure that, that those entities are responsible as well. Um, so I, hopefully that addresses the Senator's question. Ultimately, it results in um, lower rent cost or lower ownership cost um, to get that housing developed. And we're handling the actual development side um, so that ultimately the tenant or homeowner can benefit. And uh, maybe Jason, if you just kind of go over the, the balloon that we had. I, I don't know if you've seen this balloon. Uh, but basically, it puts three million for counties uh, uh, loans or grants under eight thousand, and then another three million for counties in between eight and twenty-five thousand. We're just kind of targeting, make sure them very small counties uh, don't get missed on the money. Um, but did I explain that right? Say it again. I was wondering if it was two or three million. It's three million. There's two different bills, and on the other bill, it was two million, and it's a tax credit. This is the MIH grants, and so they're both targeted, uh, both groups. The eight thousand is three million, and the twenty-five to eight thousand is three million, and then the rest is for the remainder. So, thinking of my little guys, you know, I come from one of them counties, and. You know, we need housing everywhere. We really do. And this this is a tool that we are putting $2 million in right now. And um, it works really good across the state. And, um, you know, in my opinion, it's one of the biggest successes. And, you know, let's see if we can't get you doing a lot more. So, um, you know, if there's any questions on that balloon, Senator Reichman. Thank you very much for that clarification. I just forgot what was the total amount of the grants you can have on this. The total cap was twenty million. Okay. Um, in Thank the whole you. thing, so yeah. So, is there any questions on the balloon? Do I have a motion? I'll make the motion. So, uh, do I have a second? Do I have a second. Senator Hildebrand seconds. Any questions or comments on the balloon? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Against nay, it passes. Okay, uh, huh? I did. 
Hildebrand. Okay, do I have a motion to kick this bill out favorably as amended? I'll make that motion. Oh, Senator Reichman, you want to make the motion? Okay, do I have a second? Senator Kluis seconds it. Any questions or comments? All in favor, please send it to five by saying aye. Against, nay, it passes. This bill's out and on the way to the floor. I'll carry the bill. Okay, let's move on to, um, is it 390? Yep, Senate Bill 390. The other two we're going to work is 390 and 351. Why don't you give us uh, a background on them? We heard them on Monday, I believe, and I don't think there was any opposition to either one of the bills. Um, but... I see it right here, Valentine's Day. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Senate Bill 390, if you recall, was the bill requiring the Secretary of State to develop an affidavit system so that any person in a local election office who is handling uh, ballots would be required to sign an affidavit that provided uh, certain information as required by the, uh, by the statute. Uh, that would be the number of blank ballots, the number of spoiled ballots, the number of provisional ballots, uh, the name of the person, uh, from whom the ballots were received and the location where the ballots were received. There was one opposing testimony, I guess you'd say, written, but um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Looks more like a joke to me, but um, what would we like to do with this bill? Senator Hildebrand? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, two amendments, and the first one um, would be a balloon number one. Okay, Senator Hilbrun, you want to explain it? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. After um, the initial writing of the bill and after the hearing, and I, I had some more follow-up discussions with some uh, election officials, and it, I, I felt like we needed to clarify a few things, and one of the things was missing the um, number of counted ballots wasn't put on the list, and this just uh, sures all that language up to what the original intent of the bill was. I stand for questions. Questions? Senator Francisco? Um, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, and I don't know if this is on the amendment or sort of on the bill. <clears throat> I am a supervising judge um, and have uh, worked in our elections. And so these are the things that we have to report um, when we send information back. I'm wondering, when, when does this happen? They sign an affidavit, and is it when the ballots arrive from the printer at the um, election office, when their ballots are distributed to the supervising judges? Um, how many times would this affidavit need to be filled out by employees? Anytime someone handles a ballot. So if someone in the election office is putting the ballots in the boxes for the supervising judges, and an individual carries that box to the loading dock, and additional staff members, because this is what happens in Douglas County, so additional staff members load that into the car, each of them would have to sign an affidavit, and in order to be able to sign that, they would have to open that and count it? Um, Senator, unless you guys do something different in Lawrence County than what I'm aware of, those are sealed with a sealed um, a number, specific number, and you have to break that seal to open it. Carrying that sealed box is not actually physically touching or handling the ballots. So it would be whoever put the ballots in that box and whoever broke that seal and took the ballots out of that box, not transporting that box. Well, 
but um, and and so you you can't say I mean there would be no spoiled ballots in a lot of cases right if you're delivering them to the election office there would only be blank ballots right or is this those ballots that are coming back to I I, I can't tell whether it's going out to the you know, ballots that are handled within an office, or if it's ballots going out to um, voting precincts, or if it's ballots coming back? Let me try to walk you through it um, the best that I can, and from my experience. Someone orders 10,000 ballots for an election night. Those are received from the printer. So whoever receives those would then record how many they received. What they do with those ballots, if they give it to another person, then that person would have to do that as well. But so you have 10,000 ballots sitting there that you received. Now you're starting to send those ballots out. If you go and pick from that 10,000 and you mail out 500, you will put 500 blank ballots mailed or whatever it does. Then whoever receives it's a voter, so they're not gonna get it. But if they send it to like an election officer, if they get those ballots, then you still do the same paperwork that you do. It's just a signed affidavit again. Then when you bring them back, you do the same thing. So anybody that touches it during that process would do that. Currently, to my knowledge, the only, the only ones that do it are the election judges, not everybody handling those ballots. So. Okay, and election judges wouldn't be employees of the county. I, I just you're, you're paid by the county at that particular time, aren't you? Aren't you reimbursed by the county? You're an employee for that election? I don't think you're an employee, but I could check that. Anyway, I think it's, um, do you have an idea of how many affidavits you would need um, in a county like Johnson? It's all going to depend on how you handle it. You're handling those ballots anyway, and if you're not counting them, and you don't know how many you just handled? I mean, to me, that's, a, that's an issue. And that's what we're trying to solve is a chain of custody. The supervising judge receives um, the ballots. And before you open at 7, there is someone, or before you open a packet of ballots, they are always counted, right? And then when you um, prepare those ballots to go back, you fill out the form and sign it that says all of this information. So what are you adding that, that we're not already getting information about? You're assuming that the election judge is the only one that handles those ballots, and that's not the case. The election judge, or the election, the supervising judges only get blank ballots. They, the, the precincts don't get ballots that are already filled out. So this, um, And, and if, you, if you handle a ballot, if, you, if you're working at the desk in the county and somebody brings you a ballot and they vote it, um, you handle that ballot. And it's only going to be one thing. It's going to be a counted, I mean, well, it isn't a counted ballot yet. It, um, I, I'm thinking that we already have affidavits signed, and a chain of custody. Um, that's my concern. But thank you for trying to answer my concerns. Sure, Fosco, Go ahead. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Harold Brand, just a clarifying question. So are you talking about um, the election workers when they receive ballots? So, and if you are, I want to ask you, like, if there is a uh, recount or when provisional ballots are counted in Cedric County, our county commissioners, they also touch all those ballots. Would they then, too, be required to sign that affidavit? So the canvassers are verifying the affidavits and verifying the count. They're the ones that check to make sure those counts add up or supposed to. 
they could sign it if they wanted. I mean, whenever they certify that election, they're actually certifying the, those counts add up. Okay. Any more questions? Senator Reichman. Uh, th thank you. And I, I'm, I thought I understood it, but now I'm kind of confused. Uh, under uh, Secretary of State, uh, when Clay spoke on it, he says, additional election workers charged with transporting any ballots, including cast, provisional, blank, spoiled, or void, must maintain a chain of custody records that are filed with the county election office. These forms include the name of election workers, the number of ballots received, dates and time, location of pickup and delivery to ballots, and signatures or initials of election workers. These records are maintained for two years. So I guess my, with that, I'm really wondering why we need to pass the, this bill. That's, I, I guess that's where I'm confused. Thank you. Okay. Um. Any other questions? Peterson. Senator Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support the concept of this bill. I do have a concern of the employee. I know some of these people are only hired for one day, and they could be considered to be an independent contractor. I really like the concept that each person in a local election office is the one that signed these affidavits versus the comments of the employee. Uh, well, I think what we'll do is we'll just take a stop right now and see if we can't get... Um, Secretary of State's office, Barker, to come back over and maybe we just work through this a little bit. Okay? Does that sound all right, Senator Hildebrand? Sounds fine to me. Okay, we have uh, Senate Bill 351. Do we, Are we wanting to work that or not? Do we have a motion on it or, or we want to wait and do them both at the same time? Let's just do them both at the same time. Mr. Peterson, or Senator Peterson, got a bill introduction, so let's step back and let him do a bill introduction. Mr. Chairman, it's on behalf of Senator Warren. He's in judiciary. Uh, it's a bill, RS 3289, regarding mass mandates, vaccination status, and uh, business compensation. Okay. Uh, we have a bill. Questions? Comments? Um, objections? Not seeing any? Bill's introduced. Okay, I think what we'll do is we'll adjourn today and we might have to come back later on Monday to work a couple bills, but um, not a big deal. So thank you. We're adjourned.